Well, hi there. We're on our Astounding Love Bible study, and we're actually going to be starting part two, chapter seven tonight, and it's relatively short. But let's open with a word of prayer. Father, as we study tonight, would you speak into our hearts and our lives that we would receive from you? Would you allow us to be open and honest with you? That whatever's going on in our hearts and our minds, that whatever we're thinking about, whatever we're feeling as we're reading through this book together, that you would help us to have those necessary conversations with you. We thank you and we praise you for Pastor John. We thank you and praise you for your work in his life and for all that you have done for us because you are almighty God. So Lord, today speak to us and change us like we have never been changed before. In your holy name we pray, dear Jesus. Amen. So part two is called God's Real Inner Heart and Nature. And the chapter is titled, God is Powerful, but is he really good? And the subtitle is God's Wonderful Inner Heart for Us. This section or this heading is the big burning question. As wonderful and awesome as these external attributes of God are, they tell us nothing of his inner nature, his character, or his temperament. He is all powerful and all wise, but what kind of a person is he like inside? He is sovereign and supreme, but what are his real heart and personality like? He is eternal and unchanging, but what are his inner qualities and what is his true disposition? And Pastor John writes, is God kind or cruel? Is he tender hearted or hard hearted? Is he forgiving and full of grace? Or is he unforgiving and full of revenge? Is he kind and compassionate or stern and harsh? Is he long suffering or quick tempered and irritable? Will he always tell us the truth and be good to us? Or will he sometimes trick us, manipulate us or violate us? Will he be kind and generous or stingy and miserly? It is of the utmost importance that we find out what the inner heart of our creator, our God, is truly like. It will mean the difference between trusting him or being afraid of him between believing him or doubting him, wanting him or rejecting him, and loving him or hating him. Does God actually have two sides? Yes, there do seem to be two sides to God's goodness. We began to see this in chapter 2 and what God proclaimed to Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus 34, 5 to 7. Love, on the one side there is mercy, tenderness, grace, patience, and forgiveness. But then there's also justice. On the other side there is truth, faithfulness, righteousness, and judgment. At times, these two different aspects of God's nature seem to be contrary to each other. But no, they are very definitely not in conflict. They are marvelously and in inextricably harmonized. 
These two facets of God's character are always fully expressed and always blended together, and they make a beautiful and amazingly whole, perfect person. Next heading, two bad scenes. Pastor John says, let me illustrate my point. Suppose you had someone treat you with wonderful, kind, compassionate, tender love. But in the end, it proved to be false. Just a pretense. So it proved to be false and a pretense. And the person was so sweet and promised lovely things to you, but it was all a lie. You were deceived and used. It was all a con job. Wouldn't you be deeply hurt and terribly disappointed? No matter how nice it seemed for a while, it would be a very bad scene because it would be love without truth. But on the other hand, suppose someone dealt with you in only harsh, cold truth about all your faults without any love, tenderness, mercy, grace, or forgiveness. They gave you the whole cutting, searing truth about your shortcomings with no softness or kindness, with no patience or tolerance. They fully gave you what you deserve for everything you did wrong. You only got cold justice. Everything was harsh and strict with no patience or leniency. Wouldn't you be hurt again and again? This too would be a very bad scene because it would be truth without love. So see, the first one is love without truth. The second is truth without love. And guys, I'm just going to share, and this is me speaking, not Pastor John. I've experienced both of those. And it's ugly. No matter how we look at it, it is ugly and it's hurtful. And we have a really hard time as human beings to get past that. So let's listen to what Pastor John tells us. The very best scene possible. But suppose someone poured out extravagant love, affection, tender kindness, care, and consideration upon you. They cherished you and proved how precious you are to them by words and deeds. Without most kindness, grace, and generosity, they treated you very patiently. They extended total forgiveness every time you did something wrong. They always strived for your highest good. Their patience, mercy, and forgiveness covered all your wrongs. And they consistently did all this in absolute faith, or sorry, truth, faithful, faithfulness, integrity, and righteousness. It was all sincere and without any ulterior motive. It was all truth. This is the very best scene possible. This is love combined with truth, or in other words, true love. You see, truth without love can be brutality. Love without truth can be deception, but when truth and love are combined, it is a beautiful and glorious reality. God, our perfect creator and loving father, is absolute, infinite, unfailingly true love beyond measure. Do you see how these two aspects or sides of God's real nature Love and truth must always be perfectly united and blended together. He is not just one or the other. He is both at the same time, all the time. God is perfect, complete, and holy. He does not swing back and forth from one to the other. That is the mark of an unstable person. God is not a split personality. God will always completely fulfill and express both of these two facets of his beautiful and perfect goodness. There is more about this in chapter 13 of Pastor John's book. The Big Blazing Answer. 
in many ways and many times throughout scripture, these two aspects or sides of God are seen together in perfect integration and harmony. They both are succinctly expressed in the book of 1 John. 1 John 1.5 this is the message which we have heard from him, in brackets, Jesus, and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Light, as used here, is a metaphor for truth, faithfulness, righteousness, and justice. Pastor John says that we will explore this in chapters 10 and 11. And 1 John 4, 8 and 9, God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And 1 John 4, 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. Now, love in these verses is translated from the Greek word agape, which is a special kind of love which means the love of God. It is not human love, but divine love. It is far above and beyond human love and every human effort to achieve it. We will explore this agape love in the next two chapters. Light and love. This is what God is. Not just what he has, what he does, or what he gives, but what he is in the core and essence of his being. This is his nature and his real heart. He is always both light and love perfectly combined. Both are perfectly balanced and they supplement and complement each other, making God a beautiful, whole, complete, and perfect God. Holy, holy, holy. Isaiah 6, 3. Astounding true love. Let's pray. God, I want to see deep into your real heart and nature. Please show me what you are at, the very core of your being. Enable me to trust you and love you more and more. Give me understanding of how your love and your light always work together. Jesus, open the eyes of my spirit and reveal to me the Father's great, true love. I ask this in the supreme authority and power of your name. Amen. We are going to continue a little bit into chapter 8 because it's going to be too long the next time. And the title of it is True Love far, far above all love, astounding love beyond measure, the real core of God's perfect heart. One of the greatest statements in scripture is God is love. 1 John 4, 8 and 16. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And we have known, experienced, and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Twice in this one chapter, the Spirit of God says that love is who God is. Not just what he has, what he gives, or what he does, but who he is at the very center of his being. God is perfect love. And Pastor John says, I deliberately use the word perfect because the scriptures make it very clear that God is holy. He tells us to see chapter 5, which we've read. Holy means whole, complete, entire, and absolute perfection. Everything about God is complete and perfect. So God is infinite, eternal, perfect, true love. Pastor John tells us that he has carefully studied his way through the scriptures many times and have come to see that love is the main characteristic of God's inner nature and real heart. It is not the only part of his character, 
but it is certainly the main one. How wonderful this is for us because though we are self-willed, strain sinning humans, we are still the object and focus of his great true love. The New Testament scriptures were originally written in the Greek language, and the Greeks had four words for love, whereas we have only one word in English. They had one word for family love, another for friendship love, another for romantic love, and another special word for God love. And the Greek word for God love is agape, and this is the word used above in 1 John 4, 8 and 16. And although the other kinds of love came from God when he created us as his children, agape love is a special kind of love that only God has. To differentiate this special God love from human love, I will begin to use the term agape love, Pastor John tells us. Agape love is not human love, as are the other types of love. It is much higher. We do not naturally have agape love in us, nor can we produce it ourselves. But we can receive it from God as a gift, then lovingly express it back to him. We can also pass it on to other people around us. It is unique, and only God can give it. And he gives it only by his Holy Spirit. Romans 5.5 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the agape love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is agape love. Ephesians 3.17-19, that you, being rooted and grounded in agape love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, believers, what is the width and length and depth and height to know, experience the agape love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. God eagerly wants us to experience his agape love, even though it goes far beyond the reaches of human comprehension and is exceedingly fervent, vast, and multifaceted. He wants his children to increasingly experience and enjoy his great, passionate, agape love as much as is humanly possible. The main characteristics of God's agape love are made very clear again and again in his scriptures. So we are not going to get through this chapter as I indicated, but I do want to take us through this next section. The main characteristics of God's great agape love. God intensely desires a loving father-child relationship with each of us. It is impossible to fully comprehend how great and intensely God desires a close loving relationship with us as children. He passionately yearns for us to be reconciled back to himself and to be close to him again. In the beginning, he created us to be his children in Genesis 1.27. And even before the foundation of the world, he chose each one of us. Ephesians 1.4, because he fervently wanted a multitude of children upon whom he could lavishly pour out his great and wonderful agape love. How much God does God yearn for us, his children, and fervently want us back in his arms again? Even though we all have sinned, have gone astray, gone our own selfish way, and are not all, at all worthy, God still greatly, deeply, and passionately desires this close, loving family relationship with us. What an extremely high value he places on this relationship. See how greatly and intensely God wants us all back in his wonderful loving arms of true love. Look at the incredible price he paid for each of us to be forgiven and reconciled back to him.
We're now going to look at the 30 statements below and begin to see how intensely he loves and desires every one of us fallen, sinning children. So here's the 30 statements. The high price God paid to win us back to himself. God, who is spirit, manifested himself to us in human flesh. John 4.24 and 1 Timothy 3.16. God, the word, expressing his love, became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 1 to 4, and then verse 14. The invisible God revealed himself to us in a visible image, Colossians 1, 15. The most high God made himself lower than the angels, Deuteronomy 10, 17, and Hebrews 2, 9 to 10. The great creator stepped down and became just like us, Genesis 1, 1, and Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. The eternal God stepped into the confines of time and space. Isaiah 57, 15 and Luke 2, 7. God the Father sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. Romans 8, 3. The brightness of God's glory was born of a virgin. Hebrews 1, 3, Isaiah 7, 14 and Galatians 4, 4. The God who is everywhere confined himself to a human body. 1 Kings 8, 27 and Luke 2, 11 to 12. The all-powerful God became a helpless newborn baby. Genesis 17, 1 and Luke 2, 7. The Heavenly Father named his son Jesus, God saves, son of the highest. Luke 1, 30 to 32. The Almighty God also called his name Emmanuel, God with us. Genesis 17, 1 and Isaiah 7, 14. The majesty on high commanded all the angels to worship the firstborn. Hebrews 1, 3 and 6. The all-wise God as a child needed to be taught and to learn. Psalm 147.5, Romans 16.27, and Luke 2.46. The unchanging God, as a child, had to develop, grow, and mature. Malachi 3.6 and Luke 2.52. The Father of glory came with no stately form, splendor, or beauty. Ephesians 1.17 and Isaiah 53.2. The Lord of Lords took the form of a servant just like men. Deuteronomy 10.17 and Philippians 2.7. Philippians is my favorite book of the Bible, by the way. The Father of Lights put all his fullness bodily in Jesus. James 1.17 Colossians 1.19 and 2.9. The Holy Father made Jesus the brightness and express image of his person. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. The king of all kings submitted himself to earthly authorities. Revelation 19.16 and Luke 2.51. The maker of heaven and earth laid aside his glory, became poor. John 1, 3, and 2 Corinthians 8, 9. The supreme ruler of all descended to be a lowly peasant carpenter. Daniel 4, 17, and Mark 6, 3. The sovereign God became a servant and learned obedience. Psalm 95, 3, and Hebrews 5, 8. The father of glory was despised, mocked, and suffered shame. Ephesians 1.17, Isaiah 53.3, and Hebrews 12.2. The God above all greatly humbled himself. Deuteronomy 10.17 and Philippians 2.5-8. to 
the living God took our sin and our death upon himself. Psalm 42, 2. Isaiah 53, 5 to 6. 1 Peter 2, 24. And 1 Peter 3, 18. The holy, holy, holy God became sin for us. Isaiah 6, 3. Revelation 4, 8, and 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The God in the highest heaven paid for our sin in the lowest hell. Luke 2, 14, and Acts 2, 31. The God who is love was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. John 3, 16, and 2 Corinthians 5, 19. The God of life raised up Jesus and exalted him far above all. Ephesians 1, 19 to 23, and Philippians 2, 6 to 11. Why? Why did God do all of this for us? Why pay such a great price? Because he agape loves us so greatly and longs for us so intensely. We are so incredibly precious to him. He loves us more than we can possibly imagine. It is utterly astounding, so totally amazing, beyond our comprehension. Yet it is within our grasp to at least begin to know receive and enjoy this incredible, intense, agape love of God. John 3, 16, For God so agape loved the world, you, me, and every other human being, that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Pastor John tells us, and we're not going to do it in the study, but I do suggest that you make a note of this. He says, take the time to read the accounts of Jesus' betrayal, crucifixion, and resurrection in these chapters. Matthew 26 to 28, Mark 14 to 16, Luke 22 to 24, and John 18 to 20. See for yourself how much suffering, pain, agony, humiliation, reviling, and rejection Jesus willingly went through at the insistence of God the Father because our loving Father so intensely desires to have us back, embrace us in his arms of love, and enjoy us as his children. Pastor John says to take a look at chapter 19, which we'll get to eventually, and see him lovingly embrace us in his great big arms. Jesus loves us more than all the glories of heaven. He laid them aside. He loves us more than he hates our sin. He took our sin upon himself on that cross. He loves us more than he loved himself. He sacrificed himself for us. How greatly the Father and the Son want us and yearn for you and me and every person on earth. Believe it. It's astounding true love beyond measure. But think of the agony the Father himself had in his great heart of love when he planned all the painful details of his beloved son's betrayal and crucifixion and when he prophesied it in his word hundreds of years beforehand how his heart must have been torn to shreds when Jesus pleaded with him three times in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 36 to 44, with vehement cries and tears, Hebrews 5, 7, and sweat like great drops of blood in Luke 22, 4. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 39. 
but the father loved us so passionately and so intensely that he asked his only beloved son jesus to go through all the horrible sufferings the beatings the whippings the carrying of the cross the crown of thorns and the nails driven into his hands and feet and the six long torturous hours of crucifixion then for three days and nights his soul suffered the horrors of the depths of hell taking on himself our guilt our sin and our condemnation and the lord has laid on him jesus the iniquity of us all the lord made his soul an offering for sin isaiah 53 6 and 10 for he god made him jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us in 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is why at the end of the six hours on the cross, Jesus screamed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27.46. God had to turn away from his own beloved son and deliver his soul to the depths of hell. How painful all this must also have been for the father. How deep must have been the agony and anguish in his great father's heart. God the Father was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, says 2 Corinthians 5.19. The Father himself was suffering incredibly for us through Jesus. The intensity of his great, pure, loving desire for us is far, far beyond our human comprehension there's an illustration that i'll share and then we'll stop your own lost child suppose you are a very loving father or mother imagine you were out camping and your precious little child wanders away into the forest and becomes lost do you just sit comfortably by the campfire and calmly wish that your precious child somehow makes it back to you? No. Wouldn't you leave that warm, cheery campfire and go out into the dark, cold forest, crying, calling, yearning, longing, praying, searching, doing all you can, even being willing to die to rescue your precious little one? God has done so much more than all that for us, his little children. God's agape love is far greater than the love of any earthly parent. We are lost without him. God has done, is now doing, and will continue to do all he can to rescue us from our state of lostness. Can you now understand a little of how intensely he desires and longs for us, his dear precious children, and why he so eagerly paid such an incredible price to get us back? God completely loves and will continue to love equally every person in all of human history, knowing very well that many will never receive him or ever love him back in return. But he will love them anyway, because this is his nature, his character. This is his real heart. It is truly the ultimate infinite sacrificial true love he loves the whole world and desires everyone to come to him regardless of how good or bad rich or poor they are regardless of race ethnicity gender religion or degree of sinfulness he intensely desires this close warm loving father relationship with us all this is who he is he will never change. He agape loves us totally, passionately, equally, and, and eternally because he is absolute true love. Lord God, your immense love for your children goes so far past anything that we could ever even imagine every day lord whether it be on the server or elsewhere 
People are asking, how can God love me? Why can't I believe? Looking for proof that God exists. Looking for some sign. Not understanding that you're right there. You're right there. Revelation 3.20 talks about Jesus standing at the door and knocking. And if anyone would open the door, he will come in and eat with them and they with him. That's all it is. We have to open the door to you, Lord. Father, on the Lighthouse Discord server, for anyone who does not know you, I ask God that they will open the door to you. And I pray, God, that the rest of us, wherever we may be in our walks, whether we've been Christians our whole lives or whether we're new to the faith, God, that we would see the love and mercy and grace and faithfulness that you have shown us from the very beginning. That you are a loving God, but that you're also righteous and just. And that your promises never fail. We rest on those tonight, Lord, with all the praise, the glory, and the thanksgiving. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.